you won't be in the recording. All right. Well, thank you so much for inviting me here tonight. And I am traveling out over space and time right into your houses, which is one of the very interesting things about being here during COVID times. And I am here to tell my story, the story of the person people called Crazy Daisy. And I'll tell you about that in a moment. And how I, an impulsive, eccentric, nearly deaf, fun-loving, transatlantic socialite, founded a movement that has affected all of your lives. So let's get started with my birth. I was born with this big, long, fancy name, Juliet McGill Kinsey Gordon. And because it was such a long name and because I was such a little girl, one of my uncles nicknamed me Daisy. She, he said, she's as cute as a daisy. And that name, name stuck all my life. The house where I was born is, was our family home is in Savannah, Georgia. And that is, um, and I was born, born yeah, and I was born there October 31st, 1860. And yes, People celebrated Halloween in those days. That's the day I was born. It was also the week that President Lincoln was elected. And I was the second of six children to a pair of parents who were in what was in those days, a very mixed marriage. My mother was a Yankee from Chicago who had gone to finishing school in New York and gone to Yale uh, over a weekend with a friend where she had been getting a tour of the library and decided to slide down the banister into the person who would eventually be her husband, my father, William Washington Gordon II, who was a very shy, proper Southern cotton broker. Well, she wasn't shy. She was outgoing, fun loving. She spoke and apparently cursed in six languages, but something about that pair stuck and they did get married. But in December of 1860, South Carolina seceded from the Union and my father became an officer in the Confederate Army. My mother's relatives fought for the Union Army as they were abolitionists and one of my mother's brothers was killed. It was a really difficult time. I, uh, my mother and my sisters eventually were two of us, uh, three of us all together. I had two sisters, my little sister, Alice, nobody called her Alice. They all called her skinny because there was so little food to eat. And it was a difficult four years. We were worried about my dad. We didn't have much food, but on December 21st, 1864, Savannah surrendered to the union army and Shortly after that, a Union general, General Sherman, came to our house with letters from her family for my mother. And he brought us candy, rock sugar candy. It was the first sugar I'd ever tasted in my whole life because of the war. And he, he missed his own children and, and had us sitting on his lap. And apparently, I don't remember this, but everybody tells me, I rubbed his head. And when everybody asked what I was doing, I said, well, I'd heard he was called the union devil. So I was looking for his horns. In any event, the next month we headed up, my mother and my sisters headed up to Chicago. It was a very long journey. We were going um, by boat and then by train in the middle of winter and snow I'd never seen before. It took uh, 24 hours once we were stuck in the snow. When we finally got to Chicago, I was very, very sick. And I spent weeks in bed. And I spent a lot of that time listening to my grandmother's stories because she had gone out into the Wild West, which was Wisconsin in those days, with her husband, who was an Indian agent, my grandfather. And she'd written up all her adventures, all of her dangerous journeys, camping in the wilderness, the Indians she'd met in a book that she called Waban or Early Day. And it, she told me all those stories. She was a master storyteller. I enjoyed it so much. She also told me a story about my great grandmother, Eleanor Little McPhillip, who had been kidnapped by uh, Native Americans, the uh, Seneca, during the Revolutionary War. And she'd been adopted by the chief and given a name, given the name Little Ship Under Full Sail because she was so irrepressible. 
And I was really delighted because I got the same nickname. I was full of energy and curiosity. And everybody said I went through life proudly and fearlessly in spite of strong winds and stormy seas. And I would often tell this story around campfires to Girl Scouts. I think somebody's computer may not be muted because we're getting a hiss. Can somebody, everybody double check that their mute button is on? Thank you. Wendy, you may be able to check among participants as well. In any, anyway, in any event, I loved my Kinsey grandparents and my cousins that I met in Chicago. I spent eight months there. And one of the things I was most fascinated by was seeing my grandfather uh, talking to Indians in our, in our, in their yard, um, because the Indians had come to take a check with him and get his advice before they went to talk with, with President Lincoln. And I also loved eating chicken. I'd never seen it before. I called it a nice little beef stick, beef steak with legs. On April 9th, 1865, the war was over. I heard cowboy bells ringing outside and then my grandfather shouting the news. And I jumped up and down and I said, we've won, we've won. And it was very hard to understand that my papa had lost, that the Confederacy was gone. I asked, gone where? And very soon afterwards, my grandfather Kinsey died. And that was very hard as well because he was a wonderful and kind man. In any event, in August of 1865, we returned to Savannah to live with my grandmother Gordon down there. And we were, my parents were relieved to find that though the house was quite dirty, it was mostly intact. It hadn't been broken into, probably because uh, the Union Army respected uh, the fact that my mother was a Yankee. In any event, I was overjoyed to be home, even though it was very difficult at first. My father's business had been destroyed. But I had cousins galore, including some who lived right next door. We rigged up a telephone. I don't know if you've ever done that with cans and a string. We rigged up a telephone between our two houses and we would send messages like this very day at a quarter past three, we will all meet under the spit of sporum tree. And I attended a school, a local school that was run in the house, in her own house by a woman nearby. And I liked most school subjects, but I had a very difficult time with arithmetic and spelling. I said, there's just no use in my having a dictionary. Here, I want to know how to spell scent. You know, the scent of a flower. And I've looked under S-E and C-E-N. It isn't here at all. And my brother Arthur would later write, two by two, by no means made four to Daisy. They made anything she chose to imagine they made. I loved animals. I was always adopting starving, dirty cats and dogs, much to my mother's displeasure. And one night, which was unseasonably cold for Savannah, I thought our poor cow must be freezing. So I brought down the guest room coverlet and pinned it around her. I was very surprised the next morning to find the coverlet trampled on the stable floor and uh, my mother very unhappy. Another night I burnt the blanket while I was trying to make a cup of tea for my mother. So my heart was definitely ahead of my hands in this department or my head. Uh, one winter evening, we were holding a taffy pull and my cousin Randolph Anderson was there and he, he noted that the taffy we were pulling was exactly the same color as my hair. And he asked if he could braid it in there. And I said, of course, that's fine. Neither of us expected the taffy to get all hard and my mother had to cut all of my hair off, which made her again very unhappy because the only people who had no hair on their heads were very sick people. So I looked ill. My favorite time of year was at summertime at my aunt's house. She lived in a huge house on a cliff above the Etowah River. And we pretended it was a castle and up to 20 cousins would be there at a time. So we were playing, it was our paradise. We acted out plays. We played Mary Queen of Scots and, and uh, squeezed pokeberry uh, bushes, 
berries for the juice and then smeared the pokeberry blood everywhere. And of course, we acted out the little ship under full sail story. And we gave away, we collected admission money and gave away the funds to Indian charities. We also made paper dolls and our own magazine on wet days with funny stories and poems. Uh, on beautiful days, we were swimming in the river. We had donkeys, goats, and horses to ride. We would lie on our backs and listen to the wind on a pine needle bed. And then, as we were talking before, at night, we sang around the campfire and watched the stars. And of course, you're seeing here many of the things we would I would later incorporate into Girl Scouts, arts, athletics, nature, friendship, service, and fun. By 1872, there were six of us. Here you can see us. Uh, I'm the one in the back uh, that I've labeled Daisy in the picture. Unusually for our time, uh, my parents very much believed in education for girls. So after we outgrew the Dame School uh, in our neighborhood, we were sent to boarding schools, first in Virginia and then in Morristown, New Jersey. And I found this boarding school life very difficult. I had been used to climbing trees, riding horses, and running through the woods at home. And there were just so many rules at school. I wrote my mother, I can't keep all the rules. I'm too much like you. I'll keep clear of the big scrapes, but the little ones I can't avoid. And I got in trouble for eating food after lights out and scaring all the other girls with ghost stories. I also got in trouble because I was always performing what everybody called daisy stunts. One day I saw a recipe in a magazine for getting rid of white flecks on fingernails. So I mixed the ingredients, put my fingers in, and then the fingers got cemented to the dish. Uh, a teacher had to rescue me. And as we were talking about before about sewing, sometimes my heart was ahead of my talents. On summer vacation in 1874, I decided to organize the girls in the neighborhood into a sewing group so that we could make clothes for the local Italian immigrant fruit sell sellers who uh, their kids were wearing rags. And so I started a club, we called it the Helpful Hands and I taught friend, my friends to thread needles, but somehow or other, I was teaching them with their left hands, I'm not sure why. And then uh, two boys, after we finished the clothes and gave it to them, the two of the boys got into a fight and their clothes literally fell apart while they were wearing them. So my siblings ended up calling the club helpless hands, but we did get better with times. In 1879, when I was almost 19 years old, I followed my big sister to the uh, boarding school, the finishing school my mother had gone to in New York. It was a, uh, a school where we were supposed to get the academic and social skills to become ladies. We called it Shards. All of our classes were in French. Um, we went, also went to plays, opera shops. I love fancy clothes. You can see me drawing this drawing I made in one of my letters. And I loved art. I called painting my greatest joy. I was initially lonely. I had no sisters, but uh, there because my big sister had already gone home, but I soon made lifelong, lifelong friends. We went sleighing in the wintertime. We went ice skating and I tried to behave, but the snow was always a temptation. And one day we had a massive snowball fight and we were grounded and kept inside for three days. One of the friends that I made was um, was Abby and her sister Jean was deaf from scarlet fever when she was two years old. And I saw that her mother was determined to teach her deaf daughter to speak. And this was right at the beginning when most people were not teaching uh, deaf children at all. And um, Jeannie uh, ended up going to regular school and had a happy life. So that was a, a real inspiration to me as well. But in the fall of 1880, there was a tragedy. My sister Alice had come up to school with me. Uh, she was quiet, studious, beautiful, but she didn't want to go. She was very shy and wanted to stay near home. But my mother insisted. And in December, she came down with scarlet fever. My mother rushed up to take care of her. But despite everything she did, Alice died. And my mother was heartbroken. Our whole house was, of course, but my mother felt so guilty for having encouraged her to come to school. And my mother was incapable of doing, uh, running the house. My big sister was in Europe. And so I left school to come back home and take care of the house. 
It was quite a relief to go that summer back to Etowah Cliffs for what I called a good rustification. I ended up taking bareback riding lessons. And when a, a train spooked a horse, I stayed on. I learned how to milk cows, which would be very handy later, as I'll be telling you. And I also met this young man who I would call my Greek god. Isn't he handsome? William Lowe. He was a, 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 the son of a business acquaintance of my father, and he also enjoyed art and horseback riding, and he was a nice sympathetic shoulder in this really sad time for me, and I fell madly and unreasonably in love with him. I gradually returned to uh, social life. The goal in those days was for girls to find husbands, but my heart was elsewhere. I had uh, worried about what had happened because uh, William had gone back to England, but it's I wasn't getting any letters from him. So I persuaded my father to let me go to Europe. Of course, I was chaperoned. You had to. And I had a wonder, wonderful trip seeing the art and scenery all across the continent. When we finally got to England, I arranged to visit the Low Mansion and I met Willie's sisters, but Willie wasn't there. And, but I did go and get to see his room, and I saw the only letters that were in his room were my early ones. Apparently, his father had hidden the other ones I had sent, so Willie had stopped receiving uh, letters from me. Uh, I got, however, a note just as I was leaving England on the, getting on the ship, um, uh, telegram with the best love, goodbye, and don't forget, W.M. Lowe. I was restless when I returned. I visited with friends up and down the East Coast. I, I went on picnics and rowing parties, horseback ride, rides, uh, archery, croquet, tennis. One day I was playing and do you know about bustles? Those were this, the, the lit little ledge things that were on the back of dresses in my day. And you even wore them when you were playing tennis, as you can see here. Well, one day I was playing tennis and the, my bustle came untied and was left on the court, which was quite embarrassing. But everybody laughed and just called me crazy daisy. I also learned to canoe and I just loved the uh, physical outdoors. I, and later a sailor would be one of our first badges that we issued. I had several marriage proposals, but I didn't accept any of them because I still was madly in love with Willie. And so um, I arranged another trip to England in 1884 and I saw Willie and then he visited Savannah later that year. And I finally admitted to my parents that I was in love with him. And I, I knew they wouldn't approve because Willie didn't have an occupation. He was the son of a very wealthy man. And my father was a, a very strong believer in, in men who worked. Then uh, in January of 1885, I had a terrible e earache and I had read in a magazine, I got into a lot of troubles from reading in magazines, that there was a new silver nitrate treatment and I insisted the doctor give it to me, but it didn't help the ear. In fact, it burned a hole there and I had months of pain and swelling. And finally the pain and swelling went away, but so did much of my hearing in that ear. During that time, Willie visited often. And at the end of the year, he wrote, my parents that he wanted to marry me and my parents seeing how caring he'd been during all of this ear trouble uh, agreed and um, Willie's father also agreed and gave us a house in Savannah and uh, a lot of money to live on. It was a beautiful wedding. We had it on my parents' wedding anniversary, which we thought would be good luck. And uh, my bridesmaids all had uh, silver and diamond pins that uh, that were in the shape of that daisy as you see but bad luck came very quickly on my wedding day a piece of rice landed in my ear and it nobody could get it out and it caused really bad pain and then an infection and when they finally did get it out the extraction punctured a hole in my eardrum and I became totally deaf in that ear we lived temporarily in Savannah, but then Willie felt he needed to get back to England now that when after his father died. And so we left and I was a little afraid I wouldn't fit in among society. His friends were duke, dukes and duchesses, earls and lords. Even um, Edward, the Prince of Wales, the uh, heir to the throne was, was his acquaintance and friend. But I soon found I loved the social world and I wrote home that I felt like a carrier 
character in a novel. We had multiple houses, a country estate, a hunting lodge in Scotland, uh, houses in London and Savannah. And so it felt like I was living a fairy tale. I was, um, it was arranged that I would uh, be presented to Queen Victoria. I wore a dress, beautiful dress with a heavy six foot long train, but we waited for over three hours and the, the bouquet of flowers that you're, I You're had freezing was... up. Hello. Hi, I hear you. I'm freezing up. You're freezing. Huh, okay. I'm not seeing Not that. here. Not there, just to Wendy? Are just other me? people freezing? Okay. Not not here. Okay. Okay. Thank okay. you for letting me know, Wendy, and everybody else keep an eye out for it. And if this is a problem, please stop me because I I can I have change my I have multiple um, internets here. But okay. Uh, but if it's not a problem, I won't fiddle with it. Okay. All right. So um. Anyway, I was carrying a huge bouquet of flowers, and it was getting heavier and heavier. And finally, I decided I'd. I'd rested on the bustle, you see the bustle here of the lady in front of me. And we walked very slowly through several rooms. And then we never actually met the queen because she got tired and left before we were all through. My dinner parties, however, became famous because I don't know if you've ever heard that English food is very dull and boring and Southern food is very tasty. So I brought my cook from Savannah and she cooked marvelous meals and everybody wanted a place at my table. I was also called the life of the party because I was having a hard time hearing. So I just told a lot of wonderful stories and everybody enjoyed them, particularly because I didn't, I wasn't, I wasn't afraid or didn't mind telling stories about myself. And one of the ones that I often told was the day that I was uh, walking beside a river and wanted to cross, but there wasn't a regular bridge. There was just a log across the river. And um, because of my hearing, my balance wasn't really good. So I uh, sought assistance and I saw an older man sitting by the side of the river and I uh, asked him to help me and he was very reluctant and he tried to say no and I was very insistent and finally he stood up and picked up his stick and he took my hand in, in one of his hands held the stick in the other tapped on the log as he went across and we've got across that way and it was only when we were part way across the river that I suddenly realized that this man was blind so it was literally a, a case of the blind leading the deaf. Um, I got a reputation. My reputation of Casey, Crazy Daisy crossed the Atlantic with me. I was uh, uh, one of our neighbors was uh, Richard Kipling, the author. And one day he claims that I snatched him from his port and cigar after dinner and made him go fishing in his evening dress. And then we were uh, catching a big trout and we flung the uh, the fishing line and it caught somebody's ear at our dinner. So it was not the most auspicious uh, fishing expedition. I adored Scotland. One, uh, we would spend three months each year, each summer there, uh, each, well, each fall there. And uh, we went hunting, fishing, curling. I don't know if you know what curling is. It's this, see those stones on the ice there? You would take brooms and, and sweep them across the ice. It was tremendous fun. And of course, we lived in a, a, a turreted castle. I, I felt like it was in the midst of a fairy tale. We also traveled widely. We saw camels and pyramids in Egypt. We went to uh, Paris for the 1889 exposition, along with 30 million other visitors. I rode the elevator to the top of the Eiffel Tower. I saw exotic international exhibits, ate food I'd never tried before. And I saw the electric light, a telephone, moving pictures, and a horseless carriage, all new things to me. But I found that I couldn't have children, which was a frustration for me and made my husband very angry because he couldn't have an, we wouldn't have an heir. He wouldn't have any sons. Um, I turned to animals instead and had numerous dogs and several birds, including a parrot, Polly Poons, who would like to sit on my shoulder and a little mockingbird who would fly around my hat and try to steal my pen when I was writing. But our fairy tale marriage was not. Uh, as I said, Willie got frustrated when I couldn't produce an heir, and he inherited a vast fortune, and he liked to drink and gamble and travel far and wide to hunt, uh, and he left me behind.
When we did go hunting, I, I hunted with him in Scotland and our friends for the first few years, but then I was injured and I couldn't ride or hunt anymore. And that was very frustrating because everybody else went out and left me alone, sitting alone all day. But after a few weeks or months of feeling sorry for myself, I, I said, Daisy, you've got to, you've got to find something else. And the fun, something else I found was art. I remembered how much I loved it. And I made oil paintings of our hunting dogs. I learned wood carving to carve our mantelpiece. And then I decided that our state needed some iron gates and that I would make them. Now that was major work. I had to learn iron mongery from the village blacksmith. I made my own tools and I made these, these designs you see on the gates. And I worked so hard and used so many muscles that when I tried to get fit back in my fancy stylish gowns when we returned to London, none of the arms and shoulders fit anymore. Had to get them refitted. I also started helping out a little bit more in the community. Uh, Willie had never done that or approved of it, but my father had always been very, uh, very much part of the community. In fact, during the scarlet, sorry, the yellow fever epidemic in 1876 in Savannah, he sent my mother and the rest of us off for safety to the countryside, but he stayed to help. Uh, so I became uh, involved in a charity book bazaar. I visited men and women at the workhouse, and I made a weekly visit with a basket of food and, and read to a woman who had leprosy. And then in 1898, after the Spanish-American War broke out, my father volunteered to be a general in the U.S. Army, and my mother set up a, a hospital for the men in his brigade. And so I returned to the United States to help with this. And one evening, we found we had no milk for typhoid patients, for the typhoid patients there, which was something we had been giving them. And so I went out with an orderly to find some, and we couldn't find it anywhere, but we found some cows in a yard that had hadn't been milked for a number of hours. And I, uh, my, the orderly didn't know how to milk a cow. He was from the city, but I knew how to do it from our time at Etowah Cliffs. So I started milking that cow. And then I brought that milk to the men at the hospital. And they, and that reinforced in me that sense, you always need to be prepared. After the war was over, I returned to England to find that my husband had taken up with another woman and that my things were in the servant's wing, that the other woman was now occupying my space in the main house. Um, and Willie was demanding a divorce, but before it could be finalized, he died. And his final cruelty to me was that he left all of our of the money to, to this other woman and not to his sisters or me, but my father fought it in court and did get some money back for, for us. But in 1905, I was feeling at loose ends. I, I wrote my mother, I am just an idle woman of the world with no real work or duties. I would like to get away from the world somewhere and work at sculpturing, start to do some work in that at life in life. Um, and so I started thinking about what to do and art again came to my rescue. I went to Paris to study sculpture and thought I was gonna get have a professional degree that way, uh, the professional career that way. Um, let me just let it in. But something else happened. I decided to travel and I uh, started partying around the world. I started traveling to London, Scotland, Europe, in, uh, India, seeing tigers, cathedrals, wonders of the world, and often bringing uh, along my older nieces and nephews, and often returning to Savannah as well. I, I got an app a reputation of being quite absent-minded. One day, my nephew came to a party with his friends, and I wasn't anywhere to be found. It was, it was supposed to be a party at my house, and um, I was on my bed sorting my bills into four envelopes this year, next year, sometime and never. Um, and, but anyway, he asked why I was there uh, saying, you know, Aunt Daisy, do you realize you're giving a dance downstairs? Why, so I am, I said, I'll be down in five minutes. And so I was. I also bought a car in Savannah. In those days, cars were pretty unusual and it was pretty early days and there weren't driver's licenses or driving schools. So um, 
my cook and butler would push the car out of the garage, then stop the traffic as I sputtered, uh, sputtered onto the road. And I'd be off waving gaily to the neighbors. One day, I uh, got a little too close to the neighbors. I uh, crashed through the wall of a small house where, where a family was having lunch. Um, after, when I backed, after I backed out and found a phone and called my brother, Bill, who was a lawyer, he asked, what did I say to the family? And I said, why, well, I didn't say anything. I didn't think it would be polite to bother them while they were eating. Um, and oops, I have two slides there. But in any event, um, in May of 1911, I would attend a luncheon that would change my history as well as yours. I was in London and I was seated next to the famous British war hero, General Sir Baden Powell. He shared an interest with me in art and in India. We had lots of wonderful things to say to each other. And then I admitted that I felt my life was wasted. I wasn't doing anything worthwhile. And he said, there are little stars that guide us on, although we do not realize it. And he talked about the Boy Scout movement that he'd started. He had published a Scouting for Boys handbook in 1908, which was encouraging physical fitness, responsibility, good deeds, outdoor skills. And by 1911, there were already 40,000 Boy Scouts uh, in Great Britain, Britain, uh, Great Britain, France, Germany, and the United States. And girls were begging to join in and using their initials and trying to sign up that way. Um, but he didn't think that was the right thing to do. So instead, what he'd done is put a sister in charge of Girl Guides, a parallel organization that would be respectable. And I loved the idea. So three months after meeting him, I set up a Girl Guides group in Scotland. I invited seven local farm girls. Um, one walked seven miles to get there. They were very excited to be inside the castle. They'd only seen from the outside all their lives. Um, I invited them to a very nice tea. We had strawberries and tea and scones, and we were um, soon talking together like old friends and deciding that we would meet every Saturday afternoon. And I wrote my father, I like girls, I like this organization and the rules and pastimes. So if you find I get very deeply interested, you must not be surprised. And we taught first aid, knot tying, map reading, gardening, drawing, sewing and cooking. And we recited the Girl Guide pro Promise, which probably looks pretty similar except for the King part. And I was always having house guests, often, often military folk. And so the officers were teaching my patrol to march and drill, to send signal messages. And uh, one of my friends, General Neville Smith, uh, gave a lesson on camping, asking, what's the very first thing you must take to camp? And after the girls guessed a whole bunch of things, he said, oh, those are all good things. But the first thing to take is your toothbrush. We also taught practical skills because most of the girls in the area were um, having to grow up at, or not even grow up that much to work in dangerous factories. And we felt that if we could get rural skills going, it would help. So they were raising chickens, selling eggs to the hunters. Uh, they learned to spin wool. And I hadn't done that before, so I had to learn it first. But this time I wasn't quite so helpless hands. And um, I also found a shop in London to sell the yarn. And when I went back to London myself, I convinced the postmistress to take charge of the patrol. Once I was in London, I started another patrol with skills uh, adapted to city living uh, in a very poor section of the city. And when I was getting ready to leave for America, I asked the, uh, an acquaintance to take charge of that patrol. She protested she had no time. She didn't live in London. She was no good with girls, but I was, deaf to everything she said and said, I, it's all settled. I've already told my girls you'll take the meeting next Thursday. Give them a good tea. I'll be back in six months. And I left money for uniforms and expenses and was off to America on January 6, 1912, uh, along with uh, Sir Baden Bowden, uh, Sir Baden Powell. Uh, he was doing a world tour to promote Boy Scouts. So we talked often. I was churning with ideas. I was ready to bring this idea to America. Um, and I was thinking about who I could uh, talk to, to to promote it. I was 51 years old. I was deaf. I was often ill, but I was ready to take on a new project and I couldn't wait. When I arrived in Savannah, I uh, telephoned my cousin Nina and I said, I've got something for the girls of Savannah and all of America, and we're going to start it tonight. 
Nina's daughter was already part of a naturalist uh, group, a nature group that was led by Walter Hoxie, who, which had gone camping, and it just sounded like a perfect made to order patrols. So um, that would uh, that was where I would begin. When I arrived that that night uh, for dinner, I arrived a few minutes late, so everybody would be there already. And I came in tying a leather knot. And when everybody asked, "What are you doing?" I said, "Well, I'm tying knots for my girl guides." And when they asked, "What's that?" I told them all about it. And Paige was very excited and said we could definitely organize her friends. And we started a patrol right over at, their, uh, at my house, uh, at, the, at the family home. And then the next Sunday, I told Paige's mother at church, ah, I've selected you to be the captain of the patrol. And then, as usual, I left before she could say no. Um, I was getting a reputation, and that was as a small woman, but with the force of a hurricane, stirring up daily lives in delightful, unpredictable, and yes, sometimes exasperating ways. Um, March 12, 1912, 18 girls became the first officially world registered, excuse me, girl guides in the United States. We had two patrols. They were named after flowers, the pink carnation and the white rose. And they recited the US version of the promise, which is pretty similar without the king. Uh, the first name on the register, incidentally, was my brother Bill's daughter and my namesake, Margaret Daisy Dutes Gordon. And she lived 23 miles away and had no idea I had signed her up. But, uh, and initially she was in, in, indignant when I told her about it, but, um, when I explained more about it, she was fascinated. She officially became known as America's first Girl Scout, and she would later co-author uh, my biography uh, with me. So sort of a semi-autobiography. And the girls loved their uniforms. They were initially sewing them themselves, um, and it was dark blue with a light blue trim, uh, very similar to the English girl uniforms. And as they walked around uh, town, they were basically advertising the guides, and more people wanted to do that. Initially, we met in the downstairs room of the uh, Louisa Porter home, uh, uh, which was across the street from my house. Uh, and we had a, a uh, vacant lot that I own nearby that we strung with uh, a uh, canvas curtain around because the girls were wearing these these bloomers and these gym suits and we didn't think we didn't want to attract too much attention that way and they played many outdoor games and held races and so forth. In a very short time, we had 60 members and six patrols, and we even had a patrol of factory girls. We um, had uh, patrols with working, uh, working uh, girls from working families. We had troops in orphanages, churches, synagogues, um, shops, and factories. And the idea was to be inclusive. We had Catholic, Jewish, and Protestant girls in the same girl guide groups. Um, but uh, we did not have black girls in those initial groups. They, uh, I did end up allowing my maid to start a patrol of African-American girls, but society was very segregated down in the South in my early days there. Um, we initially used the English handbook and they, you can see the first badges that they would, uh, would earn and uh, then they could go on. We established Camp Lowlands that summer and had a five night camp out there. The girls slept on the ground and got red clay all over their blue uniforms um, and very much enjoyed cooking outdoors over the fire, but not the mosquitoes. And you can see some of the things they were doing. They were carrying their bedrolls while they were backpacking. They had an observation tower. Um, Professor Hoxie, who was our naturalist, also played his violin. and. Um, they go on nature hikes, and here you see a girl with an opossum. I don't know why. One leader that summer gave her patrol a first aid lesson, and afterwards the girls decided to take the initiative and practice bandaging on one another. And when the mothers looked up from the bridge, their bridge game, they nearly fainted because the girls had were, were all bandaged up. And I later said when I heard about this that the girls must have done a very professional job of bandaging. Uh, in September of 1912, my father died, and this was a real heartbreak for me. I returned to England, but soon I was back to work and back in Savannah. I published the first USA handbook in the spring of 1913, which included um, this little piece of advice on how to secure a burglar with eight inches of cord, and also um, this note. Uh, boiling water is useful to dip your sardine into if you want to get his skin off, but do not dip him into the tea kettle. That may have been based on uh, 
a personal accident of my own. The, the girls uh, were learning about conservation and identifying flora and fauna. They learned how to sew, they learned how to shoot, they learned how to clean um, and to keep a, a, a place clean. And what we thought in those days were of the advice that you needed two, uh, lots of fresh air everywhere and you needed two openings, one for the air to come in and one to go out. They learned communication skills and, and telegraphing. They uh, were encouraged to have ex to exercise and develop their strength and self-reliance. I uh, I uh, wrote this in this uh, in that first handbook. However well placed you may be now, times may come when you will have to know how to milk, cook, cut wood, wash clothes, act as a nurse, or even defend your own life. Many things which are now done for you will have to be done without any assistance from others. All these things you can learn as a Girl Scout. And whenever Whenever there was a question about what we should do, I always said, ask the girls. And it was the US girls themselves who said they didn't want to be girl uh, guides, they wanted to be Girl Scouts. And I let them change their name, even though Sir Baden Powell wasn't happy about that. The handbook also suggested some pretty novel things that girls could do, including flying. Uh, women were just starting to take up flying, and I had a wonderful ride in in an airplane with General Smythe and called it a delicious experience. And I also pointed out that well-educated women could take up translating, work as stockbrokers, house decorators, accountants, architects, doctors, anything they put their mind to. And uh, some Samaritan parents were a little concerned. I was teaching girls unladylike things, but most people were all right with it because our family was so prominent. I was also a bit of an inventor. I, I made applications for a kind of trash can for liquids and I patented the Girl Scout pin. Meanwhile, the movement was growing. We received letters from all over the country and set up a national headquarters in 1913 in Washington, DC. And I traveled all around the country to organize uh, new troops and we arranged to have the uniforms manufactured and change from blue to khaki because indigo blue was expensive and showed dirt too badly. Um, the Boy Scouts complained our uniform was too close to theirs, but we said, get used to it. Every few months I returned to Britain to build cooperation between the two countries. And I was in Scotland when Great Britain entered the Great War. In December, I returned to London helping uh, Refugee, war refugees who were fleeing to England, but I kept writing to my girls in America and American girls began, began raising money for war relief. In January of 1915, I returned to Savannah, um, our, our ship dodged submarines along the way, and we created a revised version of the handbook since all 5,000 copies of the original had been distributed. And that June, we had our first Girl Scouts at the USA convention where we created a constitution bylaws. And I continued to travel back and forth to Britain even after the Lusitania was sunk. For the first four years of American Girl Scouting, I used my own money to pay staff, buy uniforms and print handbooks. And even though the cost was increasing with every troop. And once when I was short, I, I sold my pearls to finance the printing of the 1915 handbook. And I raised money wherever I went. One day I was going to a party and I trimmed my hat, my regular straw hat with parsley and carrots, which were uh, wilted before I got there. And when somebody commented, I said, oh, is my trimming sad? I can't afford to have this done over. I have to save my money for the Girl Scouts. You know about Girl Scouts, don't you? And afterwards, I'd volunteer all the guests to, uh, to do things for my girls. In early 1916, we moved the US headquarters to New York City, and I would attend uh, meetings whenever I could. And apparently it was never dull when I was around. Um, at one meeting when they were trying to decide what uh, about an official Girl Scout shoe, nobody could find it. I stood on my head, I tucked my skirts between my legs and showed that I'd been wearing them on my feet all along. So my mother uh, wrote that I was losing things every hour, telephoning every minute, changing her plans every second. And a friend noted, you must be the 100 horsepower engine that drives the Girl Scout airplane. They, 
the, the organization. It, we were growing quickly. By 1916, there were 7,000 Girl Scouts, and I was traveling all over the country and getting important people on board, including uh, Mrs. Thomas Edison and the uh, uh, wife of President Woodrow Wilson to be the first honorary president and wear the uniform of the Girl Scouts. And the First Lady continues to be the honorary president of the Girl Scouts in the country. In 1917, we issued another revised handbook. And you can see right here just a few of the badges and, um, and the, uh, uh, that were in that. Uh, in that. Uh, you could also see automobile, you could earn a badge in automobiling, you could uh, earn a badge in aviation. In, uh, on April 6, 1917, we entered the Great War and suddenly the girls were using the, the skills they uh, learned for the badges. They were knitting scarves and sweaters, rolling bandages, sewing clothes, collecting peach pits to grind for uh, gas masks. They served food to soldiers in canteens. They planted victory gardens and preserved food and they sold millions of Liberty bonds. And then uh, after the nurses were too overworked after the flu epidemic hit in 1918, they helped out there as well. And I remarked, badges are not medals to wear on your sleeve to show what a smart girl you are. A badge is a symbol that you've done the thing it stands for often enough, thoroughly enough, and well enough to be prepared to give service in it. You wear the badge to let people know that you are prepared and willing to be called on because you are a Girl Scout. And you can see a flag ceremony for Liberty Bonds. And uh, all of this work and activity led to even more Girl Scout troops. So by our third national convention in, in October of 1917, we had nearly 13,000 members and troops in every state except Utah. And we had started a new brownie program for younger girls. Initially, Girl Scouts were limited to 12 and up. A new monthly magazine, The Rally. And that same year, the first cookie sale, an Oklahoma troop baked and sold cookies in their high school uh, cafeteria. In 1918, uh, the president recognized the Girl Scouts contributions and we published uh, or produced and, and had in all the theaters around the country a, an 18 minute film called The Golden Eaglet, which you can see on the internet profiling uh, Scouts caring for a soldier's family. It uh, showed how resourceful and confident the girls were. When the war ended uh, in uh, November 11th, 1918, I returned to England. I needed to take care of my home and affairs there. And I lunched with Lady Olive Baden-Powell, um, uh, his new wife. Uh, and we came up with the idea of an international organization uh, of uh, Girl Scouts and Girl Guides. I felt it was very important in the wake of a war to promote international understanding in the hopes that it would lead to a permanent world peace. And so I came back to London in February of 1918 to represent the United States in the first International Council. And in May, I returned to the US. And by then, Girl Scouts of the US were 40,000 strong and I traveled widely. And, but I realized we needed more of a professional staff. We were too big. And so we created our first uh, national director. And then in November, the Senate defeated the League of Nations. And I was very concerned that uh, the US would become more isolated and that our girls needed to pursue internationalism more than ever. So uh, in January of 1920 at the convention, then I resigned as the uh, Girl Scout of the USA president. I was given the honorary title of founder, gave my the president job to my goddaughter, and I turned my full attention to international cooperation. We published another, the 1920 handbook that year. And that summer, we held the first international conference of Girl Scouts and Girl Guides. 14 countries at attended. It was in Oxford, England. And then two years later, it was in Cambridge. And uh, since my finances had had improved, I was able to uh, pay the expenses for all the US delegates. So I spent the early 1920s going back and forth between London, Savannah, and Scotland. And I um, was particularly close to my Savannah troops, writing them lots of letters and visiting. Uh, my spelling never got any better. However, it was quite a challenge for them to figure out what I was saying. In 1922, two new camps were established, one in Cloudlands, Georgia, it would later be called after me, and uh, one in England called Foxleaf Lease, which was established on the grounds of this 
incredible 24 bedroom house. And I was given a cottage on the grounds, which I loved. And I named it the link to symbolize the bond between the two countries. And it would be the site of the first world camp in 1924. Well, to pay for camping and other activities, resourceful Girl Scouts across the country were baking cookies and they would package them in wax paper bags and, and sell them door to door. They were sold for 25 to 35 cents per dozen, which is not that different from what it is today uh, in today's money. Um, and in the 1922 American Girl magazine, it, there was a cookie recipe featured, uh, which uh, all of the Chicago councils had used. In 1923, we started the first formal national cookie publicity. And here you see uh, Babe Ruth and the First Lady Grace College, uh, Mun Coolidge, munching uh, Girl Scout cookies to promote them. And uh, we were encouraging girl, in, urging girl empowerment. Uh, we had Hawaiian patrols in 1917. By 1918, we had troops for de deaf and blind and tubercular children. We had our first uh, Native American troop in 1921, a China troop that same year, a Mexican American uh, troop in 1922. It was a time, as I've said before, of, of very strong racism in this country. So African Americans were an issue for troops. Uh, some, in some troops in the North were integrated, um, but uh, most of the Southern troops were separate. And it was left up to state and local councils until the 1950s. We embraced innovation from the start. When we had some girls who were too far away to be part of a troop, we created radio Girl Scouts so that they could um, participate. And that was in 1924. That same year, I attended the Chicago Convention and I was uh, realizing that my time would be coming to an end with the Girl Scouts, uh, but I, stood there strong. I didn't let anybody know I was hurting. And I said, said, scouting is the cradle of careers. It's where careers are born. For instance, a girl tries bandaging. She finds she likes Red Cross work and she becomes a hospital nurse or she's an expert in signaling and becomes a telegraph operator or social service lands her a government job. And my, uh, my, goal was always to make the world a better place. We called that the Girl Scout Law. And so I dreamed of holding another international meeting, a world camp in the United States, but I knew I had to hurry because I had been diagnosed with incurable cancer. I did live to see my dream come true in the spring of 1926. Uh, 500 Girl Scouts and Girl Guides from 30 counselors came together at Camp Edith Macy in New York. After that world camp, I made one last trip to England to settle my affairs and visit friends. My travel camp companions were, were glum. They knew the reason for the trip. So I cheered everybody up. I, uh, there was a shipboard masquerade party, and I got sheets, put holes for eyes and mouth, and lots of empty whiskey bottles and uh, tied to ropes, and I called myself Departed Spirits, and I won Best Costume. And then I mentioned to somebody that everybody had forgotten my birthday and the entire ship prepared a party including a daisy covered cake and then I pointed out all of you know I was born on Halloween <laughs> I'm not really having a birthday today and uh, I was always pretty crazy about my birthday I would do a cartwheel every year I made my final visit to Camp Juliet Low and I uh, was so gratified when the girls sang Daisy away down south in old Savannah. First was raised the Girl Scout banner. Daisy Low, Daisy Low, Daisy Low, founder dear. I told them stories around the campfire, stories I learned in England about ghosts and so forth, Civil War stories from my father. And I always finished with um, tales from my uh, grandparents about Native Americans from the Kinseys and told all the parts, lots of different voices and finished with my and the girl's favorite little ship under full sail. My last days were difficult. I tried to hide the, uh, my illness as best I could, but um, I never wanted to become old and boring and I never did. I died at the age of 66 on January 17, 1927. I was buried in my Girl Scout uniform with a telegram from the national officers saying, you are not only a fir the first Girl Scout, but the best Girl Scout of them all. And now I'm going to take you on a lightning tour 
of a hundred years of Girl Scouting since my dad. So we have uh, the 1920s. In, in 1920, there were 70,000 Girl Scouts. By the end of that decade, almost 200,000. You see that the uh, uniform is changing as it goes along, getting a little more um, chic by the end of the 20s. And the fabric changes from khaki to the green that we associate uh, with the Girl Scouts in 1928. Uh, the American Girl magazine was published uh, for the Girl Scouts to encourage girls to think big, dream dreams, do anything they put their mind to. Let's see many of the covers right here. Lots of different activities. In 1932, commercial cooking Cookie baking began um, in, in 1932. Two Girl Scouts used storefront demonstration ovens in Philadelphia on Arch Street um, to bake cookies. And then in 1936, uh, the national organization started licensing local commercial bakers to bake and package cookies. Uh, there were very interesting subunits or whatever. There were uh, mounted troops, equestrian Girl Scouts. There were uh, mariner boating Girl Scouts. Um, and then came another war and Girl Scouts went back to work for their country, collecting canned goods, rubber for tires, picked milkweed pods this time for fiber for, to fill life jackets, ran bicycle courier services, uh, sold war bonds. They got it. They, you can hear, see right here, President Roosevelt presenting Girl Scouts with a check for over 15 million hours of service, uh, Girl Scouts saluting. You had Girl Scouts as hospital aides. You even had had wing scouts, um, aviation scouts begun then, but you did not have cookies because there was a short shortage of sugar, flour, and butter. So Girl Scout calendar sales began instead, and Girl Scout uniforms continued to wear evolving uniforms. You could make them yourself. You could even have Girl Scout robes and pajamas and such. I was honored with a ship and a stamp in the 40s. And then on, in 1948, life ran an article on the first Girl Scout, my uh, niece and namesake, uh, Daisy Dutz Gordon Lawrence. And the article demonstrated both traditional skills and more modern skills like uh, uh, journalism and international affairs. In the 1940s and 50s, the Girl Scouts became part of the early civil rights movement and Martin Luther King called the Scouts a force for desegregation. We started featuring multiracial uh, girls on in our calendars, which caused an outcry in the South, but we kept it up. And then in 1952, on our 40th anniversary, the Ebony Magazine noted that there were over 1,500 integrated troops and uh, over 1,600 all black troops in the country. Uh, and things were starting to change. There was a national drive that was begun in 1956 to desegregate. It had taken a long time. Josephine Holloway had, had attended trainings with me in the early 1920s and it created a, a lot of Girl Scout inspired activities for girls at shelters. And, uh, but it, they were not allowed to form an official troop in Nashville until 1942. And in the 1963, she would be hired by the Girl Scouts of the USA as the uh, field advisor. Uh, sorry, she was then hired by the field advisor and two black troops until her retirement until 1963. She was a, a real champion. Here you see girls in the 1950s, the things they do from chic to campfires. And 1950s is another notable moment. In 1951, the ever popular favorite, uh, Thin Mints, originally called Cookie Mints, uh, joined the cookie lineup. In 1953, uh, the, my birthplace was purchased and restored, and it became a National Historic Landmark, and you can visit it. Uh, it became a National Landmark in 1965 in a museum. Here you can see four levels of Girl Scouts in 1960 and some more rather uh, fun covers. And at our 50th anniversary in 1962, you can see all the different things that girls are doing with the Scouts. And of course, selling cookies. Here you go in the 1970s. And in 1979, I was inducted into the National Women's Hall of Fame in Seneca Falls, New York. And in 1987, on the 75th anniversary, hundreds of thousands of Girl Scouts gathered around the reflecting pool in Washington, DC. So times change, new generations grow. 
in 2012, at our 100th anniversary, we had over 3 million Girl Scouts in the United States in 90 countries, and the U.S. Mint issued a commemorative silver dollar inscribed courage, confidence, and character to re reflect our mission statement. We build girls of courage, confidence, and character who make the world a better place. And there you go. A hundred years on, girls are still pushing boundaries we get, and we're giving them necessary skills to do so. Here you see six Girl Scouts in Ames, Iowa, who got a patent after they designed a prosthetic hand for a four-year-old. We uh, Girl Scouts are small people with big dreams. Here's President Obama with some brownies. Uh, for, it's no surprise that many historic female athletes, political leaders and entertainers have what we call green blood. Uh, approximately 64% of today's women's leaders are were once Girl Scouts, as has been every female Secretary of State. In 2012, President Barack Obama issued me a posthumous medal of freedom stating, growing up in Georgia in the late 1800s, Juliet Gordon Lowe was not exactly typical. She flew airplanes, she went swimming, she experimented with electricity for fun. And she recognized early on that in order to keep up with the changing times, women would have to be prepared. A century later, almost 60 million Girl Scouts have gained leadership skills and self-confidence through the organization that she founded. They include CEOs, astronauts, my own Secretary of State. And from the very beginning, they've included also included girls of different races and faiths and abilities, just the way that Juliet would have wanted it. And you all know the Girl Scout law. If we were together, I would have us recite it together, but I think it doesn't work very well. Uh, remotely, so I'll just let you read it. I was not a deep thinker. I was impulsive, frustrating, terribly hard of hearing, but I had a trust in people, a sense of humor. I was indomitable, and I loved fun, and I saw the potential in girls with very few outlets, and my legacy is the largest educational organization for girls in the world. For more than a century, Girl Scouts has been empowering girls, go-getters, innovators, risk takers, leaders who make the world a better place. It's grown into a global movement in 92 countries with more than 59 million alumni united across distance and decades by lifelong friendships, shared adventures, and the desire to do big things to make the world a better place. Truly ours is a circle of friendships united by our ideals. And there we go, oops. So I always, actually, let me put this one more there. First of all, I'll give you one minute to look at these, see how many you can identify, and then I will put up the uh, their actual names. So everybody have a chance to do that. There we go. If there's anybody you didn't know, you can see it here. Linda Carter, Wonder Woman was a Girl Scout, Madeline Albright, the uh, Secretary of State, Sally Ride, the astronaut, Gloria Steinem, Many, many others, Lucia Ball, Carrie Fisher from Star Wars, Serena Williams. I do uh, seven other programs on women in American political history, suffrage and women's rights, as well as women aviators, bridge builder and, and, and bridge builder and petticoats about Emily Roebling and the Brooklyn Bridge. And I, I invite you to go to my website, tellingherstories.com to find out uh, where I will be doing them. Since it's all virtual these days, you can often register and attend. I also want to to invite you to go there to see my book. It's a, what I call not just a coloring book, Remembering the Ladies. For 69 women in American history, um, you, it, you have coloring pages and, and descriptions. And Juliet Gordon Lowe is in that. So if you wanna go there, if you go to my website, the ebook is available for free and um, you can use the index of the ebook or a control F command to find what page, uh, I'm on, it's 82 in the printed version, but I think it might be 83 or so in the ebook, the, the pageation wasn't quite the same. But here you go, you can see the coloring page on, on myself and learn a little bit more about me. So uh, anyway, I do thank you so much for inviting me today. And I would be delighted to start answering your questions. So I will, um,
open the floor and please feel free to unmute yourself and ask me questions or clarifications or comments or tell your own stories you've been inspired by from this program. Um, um, thank you. We're going to go to bed now. Okay. It, it is late. It is your bedtime. Did you learn something new about my life that you didn't know before? Yeah, I learned that you didn't have any siblings. I didn't have any children. I had two brothers and, and three sisters, but I yeah. had no children. You're right. But I had lots of nieces and nephews. So my the children of my brothers and sisters, I were I like to think of my children because I took them traveling all over the world and they became Girl Scouts. Well, the girls did. And um, so it, it was a really special thing for me to, to work with the young people uh, in my life, including my nieces and nephews. So thank okay. you for being here and have a good night's sleep. Good night. Anyone else? Hi. Ah. Can I can I tell everybody that um, here at the Ringwood Library we have a copy of this book, and what I did is I did photocopy page eighty two, the coloring page, and it's in our lobby. We we'll, we'll have plenty of copies available if you wanted to come Yay. in. Yay! Okay. Wonderful. Anybody else with a comment or a question? I, I did not realize that Juliet Gordon Lowe was hard of hearing. How bad was her hearing loss? It was apparently total in one ear and severe in the other. So she, she had a very difficult time. She used an ear horn. Um, if you've ever seen any of those things, in fact, she had apparently a whole collection of them. You know how people buy hearing aids these days, trying to find one that will actually work. She had, she apparently <laughs> picked up anybody who said they had a new, better hearing age, hearing horn or hearing aid, she picked it up. But yeah, it was always a problem. But in many times she used it to her advantage because she literally would turn a deaf ear to protest. She'd, she'd you know, storm into a meeting, you know, nicely. Um, and then she'd say, and you're going to do this, and you're going to do this, and you're going to do this. And you would say, but, 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 and she'd just leave again, and you were doing it. I, I like the term volunteered as a passive verb, you know, as I have been volunteered to do that. She was apparently excellent at, at volunteering other people to do things. Right. We use the term voluntold. Voluntold. Exactly. <laughs> she was excellent at voluntolding. Yeah. Must exactly. have been very difficult, though, for her to give speeches, you know, being that hearing impaired. Then... Well, of course, it was a later, a later in life thing. So she did not have the problem that somebody who's congenitally deaf has in learning language because she learned language. She lost her hearing in her uh, early to mid 20s most of it. So she still could speak, but she couldn't listen much, <laughs> but she could speak. And apparently she did. She just chattered and chattered and chattered and talked. But, um, but she, she told stories in her autobiography. She talks about, you know, tells these funny stories about herself, about hooking somebody else in the ear with a fishing line and about the, the log story and stuff. And she, you know, basically she tells these funny stories and in a noisy room as Anybody who knows anybody who has hearing loss knows that it's very hard to hear a conversation if there are a lot of conversations going on. And so by kind of controlling the conversation, she didn't have to hear what somebody else was saying. So that was that was one of her ways of dealing with that. But she, yeah, she she managed. And, you know, she, she was not the kind of person to sit and dwell and say, I've lost this. You know, she couldn't ride anymore. She couldn't. Uh, she couldn't hear as well as she could. So she turned her, her talents and interests and skills and energies to other things. And that was her philosophy all her life was go forward, don't look back. She did. Thank you. This was wonderful. We well, really thank you. Thank you for coming tonight. And thank you for uh, asking that question. Anybody else? Mm -hmm. 
All right. Well, I, I, I want to just remind you that my website is tellingherstories.com. It's exactly the same as telling his stories, telling his stories, except that it's female and it's plural. Somebody else has the telling her story singular, which is fine because I tell lots of stories. So I was very happy that I got the plural version. But um, anyway, what I, that has not only upcoming performances, but lots of lots of other information about things. So I recommend you visit it if you can. And if later on you think of a question you really wished you'd asked me tonight, but didn't think about it until we press the leave meeting button, um, feel, my email is on that. There's, uh, you can just uh, find it there and email me and I will be more than happy to try to answer. So that is what, that's all the stuff I have to say, I think. Anybody else or anything else? No, thank you very much. You have a yeah, good evening. I, yeah, I, and thank you very much. Um, it's, thank not, you, Larry. it's not Women's History Month anymore, but it, it certainly feels extended enough to, to celebrate her life with. So. Well, one of the funny th fun things about this a being April Fools is that I think she would have loved the idea that we extended Women's History Month to April 1st because she would have thought that was just too fun for words. Uh, as I said, she was always playing practical jokes. Um, the uh, departed spirits and the unbirthday party uh, are just a couple of them that I chose to include. So it's yeah. fun to do. She Great. would have appreciated it. All right, well, <laughs> thank you again. And okay. uh, sleep tight, sleep well. Happy dreams, and mm -hmm. uh, I hope many of you continue to find joy in scouting if you're still part of that movement. Uh, I, you know, there's so today there are so many competing organizations that uh, activities and organizations for for uh, children's time, uh, and particularly well, athletics takes so much time in our children's lives that not as many girls have been able to pursue scouting in this latest generation. And I worry that that's a loss because it so scouting was, had, was so diverse, um, yes. in, both in terms of the group of, of girls who would be in a troop and meeting each other, not all strong baseball players or whatever, but also of course, even more so in activities that you were yes. not, you were, you were learning take, learning a little bit about a lot of things. So you were not mm -hmm. spending all your hours focusing on one thing. And I think we're creating very tunnel vision kids these days. I, yeah. I, I worry about that. Yeah. So, that. but it, it, you know, it is what it is. Mm -hmm. And of course we've got the competition, competition from uh, all of the apps and everything else that are just occupying, uh, sucking up all of our time as well as our children. Absolutely. We, we don't Absolutely. we don't have that downtime and you think about the fact they had all summer long and, and they were really kind of running around and having to invent their own fun and learn sure. how to do things and we don't have that anymore no, no i don't think we have enough boredom anymore i think for girls it, this boys is so to, true to find so true. just with the schools the school summer events that they have and everything yeah yeah, yeah. There, there's no time mm -hmm. yeah all right. Well, Wendy, I will stop. I, I, I will um, stop the record because I hadn't done it yet. Good.